Good evening, everyone. It's great to be back in this auditorium for Media Foundation after a gap of two years. And uh, all of you know the reasons why. May I ask everyone to settle down and may we ask Dr. Reddy, Mr. Kare, and Arifa to please come on stage. So this is the seventh year of the B.G. Verghese Memorial Lecture and 40 years of the Chamali Devi Award ceremony. As I said, last two years we had to do it online and we're very happy that you, know, you all could join us and we could actually do it physically thanks to IIC, Mr. Srivastav and Tete and others. I just want to say one thing at the top because I think it would be unfair not to. In these two years, we've lost over almost 500 journalists in India alone and around 1,400 doctors. This is not including all the other medical, you know, those in the health profession. And I think uh, Media Foundation would certainly like to just mourn these terrible losses. And now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Harish Kare, who is the chair of the Media Foundation. Um, he is uh, to come and uh, take the program forward. Mr. Kare, just a couple of words. Senior journalist, editor, most of you know him. Also, he's also been associated with the Hindu and the Tribune. Um, also has been a media advisor to the PMO. Uh, he has ably steered the Media Foundation for us, the Media Foundation ship, for the last three years. Mr. Kare. Good evening. A very warm welcome to all of you. It indeed feels very nice. Uh, to be here in the auditorium is a familiar place. After the disruptions caused by our, by the pandemic, to our familiar ways of doing things. I am particularly delighted to extend a very warm welcome to our esteemed speaker this evening, Dr. Professor Srinath Reddy. We are grateful to him for so graciously accepting our invitation to deliver this year's BG Memorial Lecture. Before we kick start this evening's festivities, so to say, uh, please do permit me to say a few words about the Media Foundation. This organization called the Media Foundation was thought of and set up in 1979 by a group of high-minded citizens and media personalities, most of whom were baffled, dismayed and disturbed at the ease with which the authorities during the emergency could simply shut down the paraphernalia of a free press. This was a wake-up call for many such high-minded people. And so it was conceived that we should have an organization which will dedicate itself to the idea of freedom of speech, expression of information, and indeed freedom in society at large. His founding members were B.J. Varghese, Lakshmi Jain, Prabhat Joshi, N.S. Jagannathan, Ajit Bhattacharji. And I'm particularly pleased to recognize Devki Jain. Um, she has been, the Jain family has been a great source of support and encouragement to the Media Foundation. In honor of Mr. Viji Varghese, who passed away in 2014, the Media Foundation thought of instituting a memorial lecture in his honor. And since 2015, we have had this annual event. And 
our speakers have included honorable gopal gandhi who is who, is, who graces us this evening with his presence dear marmesh justice cp shah the honorable hamid ansari justice madan lakur and last year our guest speaker was ellen rush bridger the former editor in chief of the guardian and in continuation of this list of distinguished speakers we have dr shirin afridi this evening the media foundation over the years i think in 1980 instituted an annual chameli devi jain award for an outstanding woman journalist this is named after devki ji's uh, mother in law lakshmi bai's mother who was a great freedom fighter and a community reformer and uh, during freedom struggle she had number of winnings in the jail the award is partly endowed by the jain family and we are grateful to them the award was given in 1982 first and has included some of the best known and respected names in indian journalism it has been awarded to journalist writing on such diverse themes as social development politics equity gender justice human rights health war and conflict consumer values the list of awardees have included well known names like neeja choudhry usha rai pamela filipos sunita narayan nirupma subramanian patricia mukhim and also journalist from smaller towns who do stellar work but rarely find recognition while the chamili devi award is a recognition of outstanding work of a journalist i believe in the process and this is an important point which i need to that in the process we are reaffirming and reasserting the basic duties and, and obligations of journalism in a democratic and civilized society the selection is made by an independent jury this year the jury was headed by ms nirupma subramanian and included ms geeta hariran and mr ashutosh and before i invite ms geeta hariran to read the jury report i particularly wish to emphasize that we could not think of a better speaker this evening than dr shrinivas reddy to who will talk on a theme which has touched each one of our lives in some way or the other now ms vidhari thank thank you as we're quite proud to be part of um, the jury and i before i read the jurors report i want to give you the good news that i think journalism if we are to go by the entries we read is flourishing in fact let me stick my neck out and say that it seems to be doing better than fiction the three member jury is pleased to announce that the winner of the 2021 chameli devi jain award for an outstanding woman journalist is arifa johari from scroll.in <laughs> arifa's work stood out for its combination of meticulous reportage humanism and empathy and the craft of writing long form 
Without losing grip on the narrative, all traits reflecting a high order of journalistic excellence. Her reports, whether on the employees of the Brihan Mumbai Municipal Corporation done out of permanent jobs, or on ASHA workers in Madhya Pradesh struggling with the arbitrary switch to a new software, or how the diamond dust industry was hit by demonetization, displayed a journalistic expertise that is perhaps fast disappearing from the profession as it is practiced in the country under the onslaught of source-based reportage. She has succeeded in telling stories about people who would otherwise remain voiceless, such as the stories of the women who left their homes in Jharkhand to work in the textile mills of Tamil Nadu. Stories such as this show how India is changing in ways that may seem barely visible on the surface as people struggle to survive on a daily basis, winning some, losing some, amid structural and systemic dysfunctions, and that too during a raging pandemic. In that sense, these are reports that tell a bigger story about the country. The ideas that have driven Arifa's work clearly needed the proverbial reporter's nose to smell them out from behind the everyday headlines about apparently mundane happenings that often get dismissed in small single column reports. Arifa sussed out these stories from behind these headlines and macro numbers to tell gripping stories about real people. It also needed personal commitment to travel during the pandemic to different places to meet these people. The Chameli Devi Jain Award for an Outstanding Woman Journalist is hard fought each year. Arifa was selected as the winner from a total of 48 entries in English and other Indian languages from across the country. While most entries were in English, seven were in Hindi, three in Malayalam, and each one and one each in Marathi and Tamil. From the overall number, 10 were shortlisted. The entries from Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, Mysore, Tiruvannandapuram, Srinagar, Pune, and Bengaluru covered a wide range of issues relating to health, environment, science, foreign policy, and even nuclear energy. Several entries were well-researched and made laudable attempts to analyze current issues. It was gratifying to have multiple entries from places difficult for journalists to work in, such as Kashmir. We do hope that we can have many more entries from languages other than English next time. Unfortunately, only a handful of the entries were from print newspapers and only one from television. The jury also noted that almost all the shortlisted entries, reflecting the changing face of journalism in India, were from the new media, the small, digital, and or alternative platforms, which, despite resource constraints, are providing space for excellence in journalism. And if I may digress and say this is important to remember, considering what happened yesterday and the journalists who have been victimized. All the shortlisted entries were long-form reports. The jury records its deep appreciation for all the nominees for their journalism at a time when the credibility and freedom of the media continue to be attacked by those who do not want these stories to be told. Thank you. Shall we give a round of applause for our winner and Arifa's mother is here with us in the auditorium. Let's give her a round of applause too. The Media Foundation is honored to present the Chamili Devi Jain Award for an Outstanding Woman Journalist 2021 to Arifa Johari, currently engaged with Scroll.in's Common Ground Project. Ms. Johari is recognized because her journalism is informed by sensitivity and insightfulness as she seeks to uncover injustices 
at the interaction of gender and labor. She has probed how women workers, be it in Gujarat or Tamil Nadu, as Geeta mentioned, or in Madhya Pradesh, get shortchanged as familiar tricks of discrimination and exploitation are played on them. Arifa Johari is honored because her journalism is guided by the simple principle of a reporter's duty to look beneath the comfortable and convenient lies and half lies that the authorities, both public and private, claim in defense of their malpractices and missteps. Her work is an outstanding example of a reporter's everyday privilege to help society demand fairness and justness. Arifa Johari is applauded because her journalism imbibes the reporter's basic obligation to question the assumptions and certitudes of the official orthodoxy at all levels of governance. Her ground level reporting of municipal misgovernance in Mumbai provides a classic example of how governmental stupidities and maladroitness end up hurting the most vulnerable and marginalized sections of our society. This enterprising journalist is commended because in her work she remains mindful of the reporter's responsibility not to get taken in by demands of conformity made in the name of nationalism and national security. In her insightful report published on the fifth anniversary of demonetization, she documented the differential impact of the economic upheavals in the formal and informal sectors. In the process, she demonstrated <clears throat> how it is necessary to challenge the priorities and platitudes of the governing classes. Arifa Johari's journalism stands out for its refusal to get intimidated by authorities at a time when the Indian media is being widely perceived as having lost its institutional spine and professional elan. Her courageous journalism makes her a role model in this age of cynicism and conformity. This was the juror's citation. May I now request Dr. Reddy to present the citation and the award to our awardee. Thank you. With this, we now move, Arifa, you can sit in the audience and enjoy the second half now of the B.G. Verghese Memorial Lecture. Every year when we hold this, we miss Mr. Verghese immensely. Oh, her sight is... I'm so sorry. Ha <laughs> ha. My million apologies five-minute acceptance speech from the podium. Come here. I actually get really nervous talking in front of the public, so I kind of rejoice for a minute. <laughs> um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, thank you to the members of the jury and uh, to everyone at the Media Foundation. It is truly an honor to receive this award, not only because of everything it stands for, but also because it is an honor to be in the company of so many other illustrious women who have received it before me. One of them is my own editor, Supriya Sharma, who's here. And uh, she was the first uh, digital media journalist to receive this award in 2015. Um, Supriya is one of the most uh, brilliant reporters in India today and uh, I have spent uh, my time at Scroll always looking up to her and uh, wanting to emulate her work. Um, she's, in the past few years she has also been a brilliant and inspiring editor 
her leadership, guidance, and insights have shaped and improved all of the work that I'm being recognized for today. So thank you, Supriya. Um, Scroll has been my home for the past eight years, and I could not have asked for a better place to be a journalist in. Um, at a time when we are witnessing the erosion of our democracy on a daily basis, and when the space for independent media is rapidly shrinking, Naresh Fernandez and Samir Patil have created a platform that fights for true journalism of integrity. I want to specifically thank Naresh for giving me the opportunities that have shaped me, for allowing me so much flexibility at Scroll and for being patient with me all these years. I decided to become a journalist at a very young age, perhaps when I was 10 or 11, mainly because I loved writing and wanted to be a writer. So when I started my career 12 years ago, I knew very little about uh, reporting and the skills that I would need to develop in order to be a good reporter. I learned all of that on the job. All I knew was that I wanted to write about meaningful things and I have been fortunate to have editors um, both at Hindustan Times, where I worked earlier, and then at Scroll, um, editors who recognized my passions and assigned me to beats that perfectly suited my sensibilities. I've written over the years about communities and culture, urban development, and various aspects of social justice. In the past year, however, I've been able to write in-depth narrative long-form reports on two beats that I particularly feel passionately about, gender and labor. These are the reports that this award has recognized me for, and so I'd like to speak a little bit about some of the people at the heart of these stories. Um, people like Deepak Pawar and Pramila Dabi, who are Dalit Safai Karamcharis, working on the streets of Mumbai. Uh, thousands of spe sweepers like them work full-time to keep the city clean but some of them have been given well-paying permanent jobs in Mumbai's municipal corporation, while others, like Deepak and Pramila, have been arbitrarily labelled as volunteers who are not even entitled to a minimum wage. Last year, Deepak Pawar had to spend three weeks in jail for trying to protest this exploitative system. Uh, then there are people like Mehmooda Sayyad in Madhya Pradesh and Gangamma in Karnataka, women who've spent decades serving as Anganwadi workers under India's massive 45-year-old scheme to tackle malnutrition. For those who may not know much about them, Anganwadi workers are essentially an army of exclusively female frontline workers who are responsible for the health and education of uh, young children in every village. They monitor the height and weight of every child below the age of six. They feed them specially prepared nutritious meals. They make sure they are vaccinated. They also make sure that pregnant women are eating well. And they also serve as preschool teachers. And if all of that is not enough, the government also uses them to implement all kinds of other schemes at the village level. But just like the Safai Karamcharis of Mumbai, Anganwadi workers are also labelled as volunteers and they are also denied minimum wages or pensions or any other social security benefits. I'm talking about these workers because their concerns are always lost in the headlines in the mainstream media, particularly these days when issues of communal and political polarisation have taken centre stage. It is easy to forget how much we as a country rely on the labour of women and Dalits to carry out our most essential functions and yet we expect that labor to come pretty much for free. It's a travesty of justice and I often feel helpless when I see the state has no intention to address it. Um, so writing these stories of these invisible workers and dedicating this award to them is the least I can do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arifa. And once again, sorry for that brain fog on my part. And I now request uh, Professor K. Srinath Reddy to deliver the B.G. Verghese Memorial Lecture. Two minutes, I'll just introduce you. You need no introduction, but we shall do it. Um, Professor Srinath Reddy is President, Public Health Foundation of India. He formerly headed the uh, Department of Cardiology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Under his leadership, PHFI has established five Indian institutes of public health to advance multidisciplinary public health education. 
research, health technologies, and implementation support of strengthening health systems. He served as the first Bernard Lawn Visiting Professor of Cardiovascular Health at the Harvard School of Public Health between 2009 and 2013, and is presently an adjunct professor at Harvard and Emory Universities. He's the first Indian to be elected to the National Ac Academy of Medicine, USA, and is a Padma Bhushan awardee. Over to you, Dr. Reddy. We're looking forward to listening to you today. Mr. Kare, Ms. Basu, Arifaji, distinguished leaders of the Indian media, luminaries in the audience, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a great honor to have been asked to join a galaxy of speakers who have preceded me to deliver the B.G. Verghese Memorial Lecture. Indeed, to be part of this gathering where both the oration and the award are a celebration, celebration of journalism of conscience and courage. Mr. Varghese had indeed influenced me as a young reader and I was one among the many who were informed and inspired by him as he epitomized a tradition of journalism where facts are assembled with integrity, analyzed with objectivity, communicated with conviction and clarity, and there is no compromise on principles and no collusion with powerful interests. And even during the dark days of COVID, sections of the media shone a bright torch on the fault lines of our health and social systems. And some of them have been reflected in the writings of the Chameli Devi awardee today. And it is perhaps the virus which unwittingly earned me this honor today, since health has never, as before, been brought to the center stage of attention, both in the policymaker realm as well as in the media attention. Therefore, I will start with where I've been asked to start. What are the lessons that we can draw from COVID, both for the health and the social systems? Firstly, we recognize that we need an efficient, equitable, and empathetic health system functioning reliably at all times to provide a swift, strong, and sustained response to any public health emergency. You cannot have a health system suddenly picking up speed and running briskly if it has been limping on one leg. And therefore, when challenged with a public health emergency, you do need a system that is already well-functioning. The second, of course, is that we need a health system that does not have a tunnel vision. And we cannot have a health system which, when preoccupied with the public health emergency, is incapable of addressing other felt needs of the society, whether it's antenatal care, routine vaccination of children, treatment of other health conditions, whether it's hypertension or diabetes, or resulting in postponement of surgeries which are necessary. And therefore, we do require also to learn what kind of a health system we must configure. We need a strong primary health care system. Now, this may be surprising because the images that filled the media, the visual media in particular, during COVID were those of intensive care units, screeching ambulances, and ventilators. But we recognize that ultimately it is the primary health care system which provides the principal defense against a public health emergency and the supportive services are coming from advanced care institutions. To explain why, in terms of COVID, early detection of cases and of persons who were exposed to them, prompt testing 
contact tracing, triage for home care and hospital care, home care support and supervision, management of long COVID, the, the consequences of symptoms persisting well beyond the initial infection, vaccination, health education on how to protect oneself personally, combating fear and stigma in society, providing health education for all of these elements are part and parcel of well-functioning primary health care systems. And we saw that this did not happen as effectively, and particularly the relative absence of an organized primary health care system in our urban areas really proved costly when the virus made its entry principally through the urban portals of international airports. Then we also recognize that we need to build domestic capacity, whether it was test kits or personal protection equipment, vaccines or medicines, we recognize that we need to build public sector and private sector capacity and we cannot depend upon fairly unreliable supply chains which are operating globally. And we also recognize that we need to build capacity in the public sector too, which has been long neglected. For example, in the pharmaceutical sector, we know that we can justifiably take pride in the way our pharmaceutical sector is developed, whether it's for drugs and vaccines. But we also know that when it comes to the usages of compulsory licensing when necessary, and for essential price controls, for affordable pricing of medicines, the private sector may not necessarily step up to the task. And therefore, you do need a very strong public sector presence, even if we have to draw upon the private sector strengths. We also know that we have to build public health capacity. Our public health expertise has been very minimal, whether it is in epidemiology or in terms of actually ensuring contact tracing. It is unpardonable that the uh, task of contact tracing is left to the policemen rather than to train public health workers who are specifically trained for that job. So we do require a public health capacity which is multi-layered and multi-skilled. And as we, even for health care, we need a stronger health workforce. We are already short in terms of our numbers of doctors and nurses and other components of our health workforce. And when you're challenged with a public health emergency, either because of their becoming ill or exhausted, there is going to be an attrition and you cannot really have it unless you have built in a certain degree of expansile capacity or a slack, as we can call it. And that does not exist. So we also need to train auxiliaries, train community volunteers, and we need to make sure that we have systems on alert and supplies on the ready in case a public health emergency strikes at us. So how is our health system delivering? How healthy is India? Let me read out a few key health indicators. We have actually made substantial progress. In 1990, our infant mortality rate was 88 per thousand live births. In 2020, it is 30, almost reduced a third of what it was. Our maternal mortality ratio was, in 1990, 556 per 100,000 live births. In 2018, it came down to 213, almost to a fifth. Certainly, we can be proud, but the progress was extremely uneven across various states. If you look at infant mortality rate, a child born in Kerala has, in, has a much better chance of survival where there is an infant mortality rate of six per thousand as compared to Madhya Pradesh where the infant mortality rate is 46 per thousand. Almost eightfold difference in the same country. And when we go to international comparisons, we recognize that despite our greater pace of economic gro growth, we are not comparing ourselves very well with many of our South Asian neighbors or with many other countries in our economic bracket 
with whom we are bracketed in the BRICS uh, grouping. Uh, for example, if you look at life expectancy in terms of years from birth, in India it's 69.2, Sri Lanka 77, Bangladesh 72, China 76.5. Nepal has a higher life expectancy than ours. If you look at infant mortality rate, India 30, Sri Lanka 6, Bangladesh 25, and China 7.4. If you look at child nutrition, then even in the latest National Family Health Survey that we had in 2019 to 2021, as recent as all that, we have children under five, 35.5 percent stunted, that is height for age being low. We have 19.3 percent wasted, that is weight for height being low. And we have 32.1 percent underweight, that is weight for age being low. Now this certainly has an impact on illness of the child, and the child can easily be susceptible to a variety of infections. There can be death. There can be a loss of cognitive power. Even if these children survive, the precious brain growth which is affected is going to deprive us of cognitive power in a time when we are really preening ourselves on our demographic dividend that will come upon us in the next two or three decades if we have a population that has been wasted and stunted and the brain cognitive power depleted because we could not pay attention to their nutritional needs, then certainly we are going to be in trouble. And not only that, it casts a long shadow into adult life and early adult life with a much higher risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes coming up in early adulthood. And this relationship is also well proven in Indian studies. But there is also the looming danger of non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular diseases and diabetes and chronic respiratory disease and cancers and mental health all rising to the fore with much greater speed. In 2018, 63% of our deaths were due to non-communicable diseases of which cardiovascular diseases were 27%. But again, a huge amount of disability also apart from death because of these conditions, especially mental health disorders, but even other disorders. Now, one could argue that perhaps death from a cardiovascular disease or cancer, if one were a cynic, one could argue that the death might be inevitable. It has to come sometime or other, and non-communicable diseases are a usual way of ending life. But that would, might be true if it were a full and fulfilled life, maybe in the ninth decade or even older. But in India, 56% of the deaths due to non-communicable diseases occur below 70 years of age. 40% of the deaths occur below 65 years of age. So these are deaths that are occurring in the productive prime of midlife. And it has consequences, not only for the individual, but for the family and for the country. And in terms of economic losses due to productivity losses as well as healthcare costs, it has been estimated by a study from Harvard School of Public Health and the World Economic Forum that India's losses due to non-communicable diseases because of this amount will amount to $4.58 trillion between 2011 and 2030. And we do have some predilection for certain types of risk factors and diseases, high excess risk of diabetes, oral tobacco leading to a huge amount of oral cancers, and indoor air pollution, the kitchen curse, which drags women who are cooking with solid biomass fuels, the toddler playing around her and the babe in her arms, all of them likely to be affected in terms of their respiratory disease and even acquiring other diseases as well. But we also know that this is going to increase because we see that urban acculturation actually increases the risk of non-communicable diseases in the absence of appropriate preventive policies. And with increasing urbanization, we are going to be seeing this. And this is something that we have seen in our own research, where within five years of migration to an urban environment, urban workers in factories in three cities acquired far greater amount of cardiovascular risk and diabetes risk compared to their siblings who stayed behind in their villages. And we also know that as these pandemics of 
uh, epidemics of non-communicable diseases advance and mature, the social gradient reverses, first for risk factors, then for events, and the poor will ultimately become the major victims when the mediators of risk like tobacco and unhealthy diets are mass produced for mass consumption. And that is going to have a major challenge for our health system, which will be unable to cope. And why has India's health system faltered? India's health system has suffered from low public financing for health for several decades. It's not a recent phenomenon. Because health has not been seen as an investment for economic growth. A hangover of a thinking initiated by an American economist called William Baumol, who said health care is a cost disease. With increasing investments, you are not likely to see increasing returns in terms of economic productivity, unlike the industry, agriculture, and service sectors. This has been contested and definitely argued in a number of international reports since, and that's why we have seen ultimately uh, health being recognized as vital to development, and that the bi-directional relationship that exists between economic growth and health is important because even as economic growth improves the health of the population, uh, the health of the population actually accelerates uh, economic growth. But it has taken a while for our own economists to recognize this. Uh, but the, you can see that being reflected in the amount allocated for health budgets. In India, uh, if you take government health expenditure as a proportion of total health expenditure, uh, India in 2017 was 30 percent. In Sri Lanka, 56 percent. China, 59 percent. Thailand, 78 percent. UK, 83 percent. And surprise of surprise, in the United States, which is considered to be the poster child of privatized medical care, government health expenditure as a part of total health expenditure was 48 percent. Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Administration, all of that combined. And as a result, out-of-pocket expenditure in India has been extremely high. In 2017, it was 62%. The recent estimates are about 48.5%. But the World Bank, as well as the WHO, recommend that if you want to have universal health coverage, then you need to have your out-of-pocket expenditure restricted to less than 20% around 15 to 20 percent. And recently it does say the national health accounts of 2017-18 say that the out-of-pocket expenditure has come down to about 48.8 percent. But the total health expenditure has fallen from 4.2 percent of the GDP in 2004 and 5 to 3.3 percent of the GDP in 2017-18. So the actual amount of health, money being spent on health is actually decreasing, even though the government share may be rising. And why is that so? It is also because out-of-pocket expenditure can fall because of foregone care. If people feel that health care is costly and do not access the care they need when they need, then you don't have out-of-pocket expenditure. You can actually lower out-of-pocket expenditure and take pride in it, but actually you are denying people the coverage. So, we need other indicators as well. And at the same time, we have a great shortage of our healthcare workers. The WHO estimates that we need 44.5 per 10,000 doctors, nurses, and midwives to achieve universal health coverage and achieve our sustainable development goals by 2030. This is a global prescription. What do we have? If you combine our nurses, midwives, and doctors, on record, we have 25.7 per 10,000. Not too bad. But when we actually adjust for qualifications, are these doctors and nurses who are listed in the census qualified? And we also look at who is actively working now. Are they actually serving in the society, in the functioning, or retired, or, um, or migrated, or somewhere else? We have then 4.8 doctors and 5.7 nurses per 10,000. That is a total of 10.5 per 10,000 as opposed to 44.5. So we have a huge problem of numbers, but we also have a huge problem of maldistribution. We know that two-thirds of India's population resides in rural areas, but two-thirds of our health professionals serve in urban areas. And there is a huge disparity between states 
Southern states are much better endowed in terms of their resources and even in terms of their medical college seats as compared to Central India and Northern India and Northeastern India. So the physician density is an important element that also distinguishes our states. But when we look at healthcare, we recognize that there are three challenges to healthcare. If we ask the question, how best can we deliver healthcare to our patients? The challenges are access, costs, and quality. So in order to address this, the WHO advocated and the United Nations has adopted in the Sustainable Development Goals the idea that every country must achieve universal health coverage. Now, there's some debate whether we should call it universal health care or coverage, but we can define coverage to definitely mean care in all of its dimensions. And the WHO defines it as all individuals and communities receive the health services they need without suffering financial hardship. It includes the full spectrum of essential quality health services from health promotion to prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, and palliative care. And this is now part of the sustainable development goals as well. But how do you measure it? Firstly, financial protection. If you're really talking about providing financial protection, has it reduced out-of-pocket expenditure? Has it reduced catastrophic health expenditure? Has it reduced healthcare-related impoverishment? But then, as I said, you can show an artificial reduction in out-of-pocket expenditure by people not accessing services when they need, foregone care. So you also need an indicator for service coverage. So you must have simultaneously an increase in service coverage and a decrease in out-of-pocket expenditure to be on the road to universal health coverage. And for this, a relatively unsatisfactory, but at the moment an interim indicator combining 14 indicators has been developed by the WHO, and that's what's being studied, looking at service coverage in different areas. But then the WHO also recognizes that we cannot achieve this overnight because every country is in a different state of health system development and also a different level of resource, resources being available. So it describes three dimensions for this. One is in terms of population coverage, how much of the population is covered and by the universal health coverage program. Second is service coverage, which are the services covered in the package. And third is financial protection, what is the amount of cost coverage so that you're preventing uh, out-of-pocket expenditure being high or poverty related to uh, unaffordable health care expenditure. Now, the stakeholder perspectives differ in this. The politicians would like to have as much population coverage as possible, partly because they may believe in equity, but mostly because they would like to please the voters, as many voters as possible. Even if the services provided are relatively shallow, they would like to see many more beneficiaries, certainly. The health professionals, the doctors, are people who would like to see as many services included in the package as possible. Because I believe what is best, uh, for what is needed for my uh, patient uh, has to be provided. The best possible care must be provided, whether it is uh, cardiac transplantation or uh, renal transplantation or whether it is the most expensive form of chemotherapy or a cochlear implant. I believe as a professional that my patient should get it. So they believe that service package is important. The people who manage the purse strings sitting in the finance ministry or the health system managers or in the Niti Aayog and other planning commissions or whatever, they look at how best the money can be spent in order to reduce poverty, to reduce out-of-pocket expenditure, while maintaining fiscal prudence so, the budget, so that the budget doesn't go bust. Now, there's a dynamic tension between these three perspectives. At, at any given time of evolution of universal health coverage, depending upon the availability of resources available, you have to find the right balance. And that balance usually comes from a examination of various choices, and the choices are 
to be made between individual and societal burden of disease measurements, size of the health impact, cost effectiveness, degree of financial risk protection, affordability, what's the fiscal space, uh, equity, attention to vulnerable groups, feasibility of implementing health system readiness, scope, is it scalable, is it sustainable, and ultimately acceptability, political alignment among stakeholders and public acceptance. Usually cost effectiveness is used as the measure. The interventions among the various options available, what is the cost effective option? How much health will the money buy? But then there is another element. In addition, how much of financial protection will the money buy? And that brings in what is called extended cost effectiveness to pe prevent people from being pushed into poverty. But equity is very important as well. And equity needs to be considered in two different dimensions. One is what we can call horizontal equity, in which everybody has access to similar services, primary health care or secondary health care. The package is common to everybody. But there also has to be a vertical dimension of equity in which you are also seeing pre-existing health equity gaps of vulnerable groups and try and bridge those gaps through your program so that you are doing justice to them by allocation of additional resources or paying for additional services, but definitely you have to recognize that those gaps also exist and you have to find that balance. Now, we also recognize that there is the task of purchasing and providing these services. Usually, we expect that the purchaser will be principally tax-funded government finances, supplemented by government-subsidized social insurance programs, and further added upon by employer-provided insurance and privately purchased insurance. In India, at the moment, we have government-funded health insurance supporting 361 million. In terms of group health insurance, which corporates and other businesses provided for their employees, it is 93 million. That's only one-fifth. The government-funded health insurance provides three quarters of all the insurance. And the rest, which is private, is 43 million. So we are talking about 497 million. What is happening to the rest? they're essentially having to fend for themselves. So that is where we definitely need universal health coverage if we want people to be protected for their health care when they need it most without having to pay a heavy financial price for it or without having to forge, forego needed care. But what are the methods of payment? What are the most efficient methods of payment? We are used for long years in this country to what is known as a fee-for-service mode of payment. Every time you go to a doctor, you pay. Every time you get a test, you pay. Every time you get admitted into a hospital, you pay. On the other hand, that actually, actually this creates a perverse incentive for more tests, more requirement of consultations, and more procedures to be done, more hospitalizations, and so on. On the other hand, there is a system called capitation fee model, which is not, nothing to do with medical college capitation, it means that there is a bundled payment for services that a particular provider has allocated a number of patients, thousand or whatever, whatever the number may be, and the provider has to pay for, provide for all the needed health services of that person throughout the year. Yes, some people will exceed that limit, if it, let's say, for argument, it's 1,000 rupees it'll, or 10,000 rupees. It will exceed that limit. But many others who are healthy that year do not require those services, will not need it. So the provider will not lose the money. But there is a greater incentive for the provider to keep the people healthy through health promotion, through early detection of conditions like hypertension and diabetes, and treating them effectively before they go in for coronary artery bypass surgery or renal transplantation. Now, that system exists, for example, in the National Health Service in UK. It exists through the Kaiser Permanente system in uh, some of the states in the US. So we have to really look at how best we can achieve some of those balancing elements as we move forward. And for that, we may actually need to bring in 
the private sector also in a much more responsible manner rather than leave it entirely in a laissez-faire style of operation. So the role of the government is provision through strengthened public sector and contracted private sector where there is need and opportunity. Public financing from tax revenues, principally from the budget and also through social insurance programs. Pooling to have a single payer system. We ought not to have multiple payers because that is inefficient. On the other hand, with a single payer, you are actually going to have much greater capacity for negotiating a fair bargain from the service provider. And you can actually reduce the price of the care and increase the size of the service package. The Tamil Nadu Medical Systems Corporation, for example, used this method of procurement in order to use what's called the monopsonic power, which is opposite of monopoly power, in order to ensure that they reduce the price of medicines quality by procuring quality assured generics. So purchasing is important. Regulation is also very important of standards, quality, price, ethics, education. All of these areas uh, need regulation. What do we do with the private sector? We have a very large number of our doctors, 80% of our doctors and 70% of our nurses are in the private sector. So we cannot ignore it because our mixed health system has evolved by default rather than by design, but we still have to make the best use of what we have. So we need to bring in the private sector in a much more responsible way. And there, they have shown a reluctance in general, the organized private sector, uh, has shown a reluctance to participate in primary care. We ought to see how best they can actually, if they do come into primary care, to partner with the government in a much more responsible manner, particularly in the implementation of national health programs, whether it's tuberculosis control. No, you can't really think of TB control without the private doctors in practice to whom people go without being part of that system. So their contribution to national health programs has to become important. Even their pro providing data on infectious diseases is going to be important. So the private sector has to be brought in in a proper manner so that they are regulated and they actually become part of the overall framework without operating with total independence and impunity. Now in terms of secondary and tertiary care, they are already participating in the Pradhan Mantri Jana Aragya Yojana, but since it is disconnected to primary care, they are only happy to take the money for the government-funded programs for secondary and tertiary care, but they are not really willing to get into primary care where the profits are much less. So you definitely need to see how best you can actually get them to link up in a better manner. And they also can be part of the pool procurement process where they can also take, get the procured drugs and equipment at a lower price through the central procurement process and they pass on the benefit to the consumer. So there are a number of ways in which we can really look at it. Public-private partnerships have acquired an odium with many of the uh, people in the civil society calling them partnerships for private profit. But if we redefine the scope as partnership for public purpose and define the public purpose very clearly and define the deliverables and accountability mechanisms also very clearly, then we may be able to make better use of the private sector that ex exists. Of course, all of this requires stewardship and governance, which is much more capable and competent. So in terms of public financing for health, we need to increase the general tax revenue, uh, not only increasing the tax to GDP ratio, but also improving our tax collection systems. We may have to think in terms of some special taxes on tobacco, alcohol, uh, and uh, uh, unhealthy foods and luxury uh, vehicles, and see whether some of that money can be spent for universal health coverage like Philippines has done, and also at the same time improve allocative and utilization efficiencies, not pump in money into tertiary care, but strengthen primary care and secondary care through district hospitals much better. My former director at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, late Ramalinga Swami, said something which has actually been repeated by many others later on, but without attribution properly, but he was the first one to say it in an international report that we need more money for health and more health for the money. So we need 
to spend it better as well. But for this, we need to revitalize our primary health care services. We need to invest more in rural and urban primary health care services, strengthen our sub-centers with tech technology-enabled frontline uh, non-physician health care providers, convert static facilities into nearer-to-home outreach facilities, improve physical and IT connectivity between sub-centers, primary health centers, community health centers, and district hospitals, improve referral and follow-up systems, promote integrated care through networks of providers, and enhance community participation and monitoring. So I would say that we did try some of this through the National Rural Health Mission and the Rashtriya Swasti Bhima Yojana, but because of the limited scope of services and limited financing available, it did not proceed very well, though well-intentioned. The benefits were limited. So in 2011, when the Planning Commission asked us to come up with a plan for uh, making key recommendations for universal health coverage, we said, commit at least 2.5% of the GDP as public financing for health immediately, and then raise it later on. Prioritize primary health care for financing and human resource development and deployment. Conduct a review of all government-funded programs, central and state, and merge them into a single pool. Provide essential drugs free of cost, because 70% of out-of-pocket expenditure is outpatient care, and 70% of that is on drugs. So if you can provide quality-assured generic drugs free of cost, essential drugs, then you're going to make an immediate impact on uh, reducing out-of-pocket expenditure. And establish credible and effective regulatory systems, and enable active community participation. Now, some of these have happened. Aishman Bharat has brought in some components of this in terms of comprehensive primary health care through health and wellness centers, national health protection mission, uh, also uh, acquired the name of Pradhan Mantri Janarugi Yojana. But these are relatively piecemeal. More importantly, there are disconnects. Primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care are not collected connected in a harmonious, seamless fashion. So we need to remove these disconnects, and we need to create a coherent healthcare system which can provide care at all levels. And the 15th Finance Commission has done us a service by emphasizing the need for primary care, urban health, disease surveillance, critical care centers, allied health workforce training, many of which were gaps earlier. I think COVID brought these needs very much into focus, and I think some of the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission have been reflected in the union budgets of 2021 and 2022, and we now have new schemes called Pradhan Mantri, um, Aishman Bharat, Health Infrastructure Mission, and the Digital Health Mission. So let me step away a little now in terms of my concluding segment which is that health, there's a quote from Gunnar Mildel, a Swedish economist, Nobel laureate of 1974, quote, health leaps out of science and draws nourishment from the totality of society. So we recognize that the determinants of health lie mostly outside of the health sector. While health sector is absolutely important, there is health beyond health care, which needs to be addressed. And if we take health financing, if we take three circles, in the innermost circle is health financing, which comes from tax and social insurance and other forms of insurance. But in order to make it into universal health coverage, you need a functioning health system with a health workforce infrastructure, governance, drugs, vaccines, and technologies, community engagement, health management information systems. If you combine those two circles, you get universal health coverage, but still you don't get a healthy society. You still need an outer circle of social determinants of health, those which operate at the broader societal level, water, sanitation, food systems, physical environment, social stability, and those that operate at the individual level but are propelled by social forces, a person's education, occupation, income, gender, social support networks. You can have 
inequalities in every level, in every form, and unless you address those, you will never be able to create a healthy society. A British economist of the early 20th century, Arich Tani said, it's not just enough to provide equality of opportunity. What we need is an equal start, not just an open road. He described equality of opportunity as decorous drapery. Unless you actually influence the social determinants of health so that a child has good nutrition from not only birth, but from the prenatal period of her mother, from the time the mother was a girl child, unless you make sure that the various forms of discrimination are removed from society, you will continue to have difficulties even if you provide equality of opportunities. And for a girl child, it, uh, many of these are epigenetically modified. The social forces act upon, and environmental, physical environmental forces act upon how the genes are expressed not only in one generation, but sometimes across multiple generations. If a woman who is pregnant is undernourished, the girl baby in her womb will be undernourished and born, susceptible to a variety of health conditions. But that girl baby has over eggs in her. Those two would have been epigenetically influenced so that not only the child yet to be born, but the child yet to be conceived also is affected. So multiple generations can be affected. So we have to address all these determinants if you have to create a healthy society. You have to recognize inequality in all its forms and then try and correct them and not just depend upon hospitals for delivering health care, though they too are necessary. But to close finally, and just let me give you an example of how the social determinants are very vital. It is very clear that, as I said, there's a bidirectional relationship, even at the population level. As the economic development increases at the population, the health status reflected by life expectancy also increases. And this happens fairly steeply when the economic development is at a relatively low level. But by the time you reach $5,000 per capita, it sort of plateaus off. The incremental benefits are much lower. But at any given level of economic development, even amongst the rich countries, those that benefit best in terms of health as well as other social indicators are those that have the lowest level of inequality in the population. Among all the OECD countries, the United States lags behind in life expectancy and other social indicators. And you just have to compare Japan and United States and you see the gap. Therefore, countries must not only focus on economic development, but also ensure that there is equality, that the income gaps and other social gaps are not wide and awning, if you want to get the best in terms of health benefits, if you want to create a healthy society. And that's important. And this is something that has been pointed out by Wilkinson and Prickett in their book, Spirit Level, and it's been shown very clearly. Now, for example, the US spends 18% of its GDP on health, whereas other OECD countries spend about two-thirds or half of that, but all of them have higher life expectancy. Now, climate change. With Vandana Ji there in the audience, I cannot but talk about climate change and food systems and agriculture. We know that as climate change accelerates, we are going to see a huge amount of health effects, vector-borne diseases, as humans in increasing temperatures will wilt and lie listless in the soaring temperatures. The mosquitoes will get athletic and climb to higher altitudes. They'll spread farther and faster. And you'll see many more mosquito-borne diseases like malaria, dengue, chikungunya, and other diseases spreading much, much more. You see severe heat effects. You see extreme weather effects, floods and famine, all of them. And on food and agriculture systems, just to close on that, for every one degree rise in, uh, rise in, uh, one degree centigrade rise in temperature, in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, there'll be a 10% decrease 
in the yield of staples. And we are already operating at a very high level in terms of our temperature vulnerability for our staples in India and, and uh, uh, in South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. But the quality of food also will decrease. There will be a reduction in the zinc, iron, and protein content of these staples. And the Data Science Institute of Columbia University has forecast that by 2050, if climate change continues the way it is, India's agricultural system will have serious challenges, and we will be creating 49.6 million new zinc deficient persons, 38.2 million new iron deficient persons, 106 million children, and 396 million women will be iron deficient, only by climate change. And they have said that if you actually change your systems to more, more climate resilient, but also more water efficient, resource efficient crops like millets and sorghum, you may be able to forestall some of this. So let me conclude by saying that never before in human history have we been so forewarned of the disaster that might await us. But never before in human history have we been so forearmed with the knowledge and tools to alter that destiny. It is a challenge to human intellect and enterprise as to how best we respond to this challenge with social solidarity and global solidarity, but also with a commitment that we shall move on the right path to ameliorate all forms of inequality. And here, we need the media to take the lead, and we in the public health community are ready to partner. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. That was so comprehensive. And it's, it's what struck me sitting there and listening to you was, you know, the kind of uh, contiguous arguments of Arafa in her stories and what you are saying about inequity. Unless we address that, we're getting nowhere. And the falling health expenditure, unfortunately, will just ensure that we keep on floundering when it comes to any public health emergency in this country. Uh, I, I believe we have about um, four or five minutes for any questions from the audience to Dr. Reddy. Uh, there's a mic which is going around, which can be come to you. Do we have any question? There's a gentleman there in the pink shirt, yes. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Suman Berry, and my question is uh, to link up what Dr. Reddy had to say with the awardee. So, you know, India has had one of the largest and earliest uh, interventions uh, for maternal nutrition, early childhood uh, development, and yet the outcomes in terms of uh, uh, maternal health, uh, stunting, etc., are what the way you painted them. So, do you draw the link between, as it were, uh, the treatment of the Anganwadi workers that um, our awardee um, has uh, has illustrated and these poor outcomes? The larger question is: We have the programs, but we don't have the outcomes. So, what? Where is the spark missing? Why are we so much behind our peers in uh, Sri Lanka? And secondly, the point that you made, what is it that Madhya Pradesh should be learning from Kerala on, on how to, as it were, narrow the gap between input and output? Yes. Um... Nutritional programs are helpful. But firstly, they have to provide balanced nutrition. That's not always been the case. Look at Madhya Pradesh, for example. They've again gone back and banned eggs. So you have to make sure that your programs are actually well-structured and not necessarily being driven by some ideological prejudices. Secondly, you have to make sure that whatever is actually being supplied is being properly delivered and is reaching the intended beneficiary. There are many leaks along the way as well. Third, it, some degree of supplemental nutrition helps, 
but it cannot really take away from the poor nutrition which the family is forced to suffer because of a poor economic constraint. We know, for example, uh, the Enriga has actually improved nutritional status wherever it functioned well. So there are some lessons that we have to learn how to enhance the income level of the family as well, at the same time while providing supplemental nutrition wherever you can in the most efficient manner, but try and provide the most balanced nutrition as well. That is also going to be an important element. So these are some of the things that we ought to look at. But there are also other challenges. We need what are called nutrition sensitive measures. If you don't have proper water and sanitation, then if the child is going to get diarrheal diseases, the nutrition is not going to be retained. So there has to be a multi-pronged effort, both nutrition sensitive and to some extent nutrition specific. I would say that's important. As far as what Madhya Pradesh has to learn, I think Madhya Pradesh has to learn, first of all, multiple things. Uh, for example, uh, the whole idea of how Kerala has done well is because of the strength it has in uh, women's literacy, women's uh, participation in the workforce, the whole social structure. But as an immediate measure, I would say they must double the number of their ashas and auxiliary nurse midwives. That will provide much greater employment to women as well enhance their capacity. We cannot produce doctors very fast, so at least the frontline health workers who can be recruited, trained, technology enabled, they can actually enhance the frontline health workforce very fast. But take a broader element when people ask me, what is your prescription for India's health in terms of various states? My simple or rather simplistic answer is, if every state had the social determinants of Kerala, and the health system of Tamil Nadu, we'd all be in a better place. Thank you so much. I think there's one question, and I'm afraid that will have to be the last. If you can make your question quick, yeah. short, please. I would just like to know, what is the percentage of population which is suffering from NCDs, non-communicable diseases, in the country, number one. Number two, how much GDP is lowered due to NCDs in the country. And ultimately... Okay, I will not allow you a number three. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Yes, Rajiv, please. Just fleeting please, question. Please, Anyhow. Please have to, yeah. Anyhow. And it is just a very common adage that health of the nation is more important than the wealth of the nation. No? That also you must propagate. No? <laughs> as far as the prevalence of NCDs is concerned, there are difficulties in estimating the numbers accurately because our surveys have not been comprehensive. They have been relatively piecemeal, though some ICMR studies have been done which have attempted to capture. And NCDs are a broad bucket. They include cardiovascular disease, which also includes hypertension, they include diabetes, they include chronic lung disease. You have prevalence estimates for all of them separately. Just to give you an example, hypertension prevalence in urban areas is anywhere between 27 to 30% among adults. Diabetes prevalence is very variable across the country. In cities like Chennai, it's upward of 20% in, in measured diabetes. Uh, probably close to 24% now, whereas in other parts it's lower, rural areas it's lower. But you'd be shocked to hear a statistic that has been produced by a survey between of Chennai and Delhi, and uh, Professor Nikhil Tandon from All India Institute of Medical Sciences uh, uh, some over six years ago. The survey in Delhi, which includes all criteria for diagnosing diabetes, and all criteria for diagnosing pre-diabetes, various criteria, if you add all of them, 78% of Delhi's population, adult population, is either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Now, you have to be shocked at that. 
lot of your so, utterances, Dr. Reddy, have been really headline grabbing. <laughs> and I'm afraid of, uh, for your truth telling, and I hope that you don't get the Pegasus in your phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for all um, that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm afraid we have come to the end of the program. We've got three minutes uh, to eight. And uh, this is the time where I must thank all the people who've been here. First of all, Dr. Reddy, Arifa for having you know um, been here and made us all believe in journalism again. Every year we do that. Um, IIC for always supporting us and giving us this wonderful venue, and we were dying to come back in person. Um, Mr. Srivastav, the director, who's, I think, left um, program division, headed by Tete, who's always so supportive. Devaki, if, is Devaki here? Devaki, for her generosity, the three-member jury of the Chameli Devi Awards, Nirupama Subramaniam from the Indian Express, writer Geeta Hariharan, and Ashutosh from Satya Hindi, the PHFI team and the Media Foundation team, especially Shailaja Bajpai, Shuma Raha, Rajiv Mehrotra, and all the others who worked tirelessly, including Manika Chopra, who hasn't put her name in here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for being here and hope to see you again next year. Thank you. Thank you.